In this video, we're going to talk about drugs that work by affecting enzyme kinetics. In the past few videos, we've been talking about enzymes, which are proteins that increase the rate of a reaction by decreasing the activation energy. Without enzymes, the rates of many reactions wouldn't be fast enough to sustain life. Since enzymes are such a critical component of many biological processes, drugs that target enzymes and affect their activity can be very powerful. Drugs or molecules that increase the activity of an enzyme are known as activators, and drugs or molecules that decrease the enzyme activity are known as inhibitors. In this video, we're going to primarily focus on inhibitors. While there are important medicines that we use that are enzyme activators, for example, heparin is an activator of antithrombin-3, which is involved in regulating the coagulation cascade, it's generally easier to design a drug that prevents an enzyme from working properly than it is to design a drug that makes an enzyme work better. There are several different mechanisms by which drugs can inhibit enzymes, and a very common step one question will ask you to determine what kind of inhibition is occurring based on the effect on the Michaelis-Menten curve or the line weaver berg plot of an enzymatic reaction. So having a solid grasp on these concepts is really important. The first kind of inhibition is called reversible competitive inhibition. In reversible competitive inhibition, the ligand, which is just a fancy word for any molecule that's binding to the enzyme, in this case we're going to be thinking about our drugs, is designed to mimic the structure of the substrate. So here we have our enzymatic reaction without the presence of any enzyme inhibitor. We have our enzyme and our substrate forming that enzyme-substrate complex and then forming the enzyme and the product. A reversible competitive inhibitor that's going to be this orange molecule here looks very similar in structure to the endogenous substrate of the enzyme, which means that it's able to bind to the same active site. However, when this orange molecule binds to the enzyme, the enzyme isn't able to act on it to form a product the way that it can with the substrate. So basically any enzyme that is currently bound to a competitive inhibitor is unable to contribute to the reaction proceeding. Now importantly, the binding between a reversible competitive inhibitor and the enzyme is non-covalent, so it doesn't form very strong or permanent bonds. This enzyme inhibitor complex can bind and then unbind, and once the enzyme is unbound, it can bind either to the inhibitor again or to the substrate, at which point it could do the reaction. So for reversible competitive inhibition, the inhibitor and the substrate are competing for the same active site. And whether the inhibitor or the substrate wins the competition is going to depend on the concentration of both molecules. Let's consider a cell in which this reaction is occurring. The cell is going to have some constant amount of enzyme in it. And when the substrate concentration is zero, the velocity of the reaction is also going to be zero because there's no substrate for the enzyme to act upon. As we increase the substrate concentration, the velocity of the reaction will increase. And as the substrate concentration increases even more and the enzyme becomes saturated, the velocity will plateau towards its Vmax. Now let's consider what would happen if before we add the substrate, we add in a constant amount of the reversible competitive inhibitor. So now this enzyme is going to form these inhibitor enzyme complexes prior to the substrate being present in the solution. Now when we add in a low concentration of substrate, the substrate has to compete with the reversible competitive inhibitor for the active site. And at low concentrations of the substrate, the enzymes are going to be more likely to stay bound to that competitive inhibitor rather than unbinding and binding to the substrate instead, because the chances of the enzyme inhibitor complex bumping into a substrate is fairly low. So that means that at low concentrations, there might not be any substrate bound to the enzyme at all, and the initial velocity will be zero even though there is some substrate around in the solution. As the substrate concentration increases, the probability of an enzyme substrate complex forming instead of an enzyme inhibitor complex forming starts to increase. So the reaction velocity will start to increase as well. However, since the inhibitor is still binding to some of the enzyme binding sites, this effectively removes some of the enzyme from being available to participate in the reaction. So the initial velocity across a range of substrate concentrations is going to be lower than it would be normally without the inhibitor.
Now let's consider what will happen if the substrate concentration is super high relative to the amount of reversible competitive inhibitor in the solution. Now the probability of the enzyme inhibitor complex forming is very low, and the probability of the enzyme substrate complex forming is very high. So this reaction is going to approach the original maximal velocity of the reaction without any inhibitor. At a high enough substrate concentration, you could even wind up with a situation where all of the enzyme is bound to a substrate and not an inhibitor. So this curve will eventually reach the maximal velocity of the enzymatic reaction without any inhibitor present. It will just require a higher substrate concentration to do so. That's actually one of the best ways to identify a reversible competitive inhibitor on a Michaelis-Menten curve. Reversible competitive inhibitors are the only kind of inhibitor that have no effect on the maximal velocity of the enzymatic reaction. Another telltale sign of a reversible competitive inhibitor is an apparent increase in the Km of the enzyme. So you can see if we look at where 50% of the Vmax is, that's probably somewhere around here. The Km of the original enzymatic reaction is at a lower concentration than the Km of the enzyme reaction with inhibitor present. Now importantly, the competitive inhibitor hasn't actually changed how strongly the enzyme is able to bind for the substrate. It's just made it less likely for that to happen and to compensate for that decrease in probability, there needs to be an increased substrate concentration for the same amount of binding to occur. But the actual affinity hasn't changed, it just appears like it has. On a line weaver Burk plot, remember that the y-intercept is going to be the reciprocal of the Vmax, and the x-intercept is going to be negative 1 over the Km. So if the Vmax doesn't change with a competitive inhibitor, the y-intercept isn't going to change either. However, the Km is going to increase, which means the reciprocal of the Km is going to decrease. And what you end up with is a line that looks something like this. So if you see a line weaver Burke plot where the y-intercept is the same with or without the inhibitor, but the slope is steeper, that's likely going to be a reversible competitive inhibitor. An example of a reversible competitive inhibitor are sulfa antibiotics, which inhibit dihydropteroate synthase, which is an important enzyme involved in bacterial folate synthesis. Moving on now to irreversible competitive inhibitor, which is represented by this red molecule here. This is a very similar concept where the ligand binds to the active site of the enzyme. However, in irreversible competitive inhibition, the inhibitor and the enzyme form a strong covalent bond. And this bond permanently alters the enzyme binding site such that it's no longer able to bind any more substrate for the duration of the enzyme's existence. So unlike reversible competitive inhibitors, where the enzyme was able to unbind from the inhibitor and bind substrate instead, enzymes that have bound to an irreversible competitive inhibitor once can never bind to a substrate again. This means that any enzyme that interacts with an irreversible competitive inhibitor is effectively removed from the solution. So let's consider now what is happening in our cell. So let's say we have four enzymes in the solution, and we're going to add in some irreversible competitive inhibitor, and that's going to permanently inactivate two of these enzymes. Now when we add in a low concentration of substrate, the substrate is able to bind the remaining two enzymes just as effectively as it could without any inhibitor present. And the two remaining enzymes will never be able to do the reaction as quickly as four enzymes because maximal velocity is directly dependent on the number of enzymes that are available to do the work of the reaction. So this means this reaction will plateau out at a lower velocity. So on the Michaelis-Menten curve, adding an irreversible competitive inhibitor will decrease the Vmax, but the Km will remain unchanged. On a line weaver Burke plot, the x-intercept is going to stay exactly the same, but since the Vmax will decrease, the reciprocal of the Vmax will increase. And you'll wind up with a curve that has the same x-intercept, but a steeper slope. An example of irreversible competitive inhibition is how aspirin permanently inhibits cyclooxygenase by acetylating a serine residine in its active site. So far we've considered inhibitors that bind to the active site of the enzyme. We'll now consider inhibitors that bind sites other than the active site. Non-competitive inhibitors bind to a site that inhibits enzyme activity without inhibiting substrate binding. 
So for example, when the enzyme is bound to this purple molecule here, the substrate could still bind, but the enzyme can no longer turn that substrate into a product. Since the binding site is neither affected nor occupied by non-competitive inhibitors, the KM is going to be unaffected. However, since the substrate does not interact with the same site as the ligand, it's not able to compete off the inhibitor from the enzyme. So once the enzyme is bound to a non-competitive inhibitor, it's likely to stay bound. Just like irreversible competitive inhibition, this is also going to lower the concentration of functioning enzyme, which will cause the Vmax to decrease. You'll notice that non-competitive inhibitors have the same exact effects as irreversible competitive inhibitors on the Michaelis-Menten curve and the line weaver burke plot, and there's no straightforward way to tell these two types of inhibitors apart on a Michaelis-Menten curve or a line weaver burke plot. If you're asked to differentiate between these two types of inhibitors, you would need to be given more than just the curves to answer the question. An example of a non-competitive inhibitor is the poison cyanide, which non-competitively inhibits cytochrome C oxidase as part of the electron transfer chain. The last kind of inhibitor we'll talk about are uncompetitive inhibitors. These inhibitors do not bind to the enzyme itself, but rather bind to the enzyme substrate complex. So the enzyme must be bound to the substrate before inhibition can occur. Uncompetitive inhibition is similar to non-competitive inhibition in that since the enzyme binds to a different site than the substrate, the substrate cannot compete off the inhibitor, and any enzymes bound to the inhibitor are effectively removed from the solution. That means that the Vmax will decrease. However, unlike non-competitive inhibition where the KM stays the same, the apparent KM here will actually decrease. And the reasoning for this is a little bit confusing, so I'm going to actually write out the reaction equation here. So this is the same reaction that we were looking at up here, but now the enzyme substrate complex also has an additional reaction that it can undergo to form the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex. The presence of this second reaction is going to reduce the amount of enzyme substrate complex, which disturbs the dynamic equilibrium. And Le Chatelier's principle tells us that when the dynamic equilibrium is disturbed, other things are going to shift in order to reestablish that equilibrium. The equilibrium will shift away from forming the enzyme and the substrate separately and towards forming the enzyme substrate complex. So the enzyme and substrate forming the enzyme substrate complex is going to occur more readily than the reverse reaction. This makes the KM appear decreased because lower concentrations of the substrate are able to form the same amount of enzyme substrate complexes and achieve a similar velocity as higher concentrations without that uncompetitive inhibitor present. So on the michaelis menten curve, we're going to have the decreased Vmax, and we're going to have a decreased Km, which means that higher velocities occur at lower concentrations. So that curve is going to look something like this. On the line weaver burke plot, the y-intercept is going to be increased from the reaction without any inhibitor since the Vmax is decreasing. And then the x-intercept is also going to shift to the left because this value is going to be smaller, so the magnitude of this value is going to be bigger, and since it's negative, it's going to shift to become more negative. And you end up with a line that looks something like this. Unlike all the other inhibitors that we've looked at so far, both the y-intercept and the x-intercept have shifted, and as a result, the slope actually remains the same, because recall that the slope on a line weaver burke plot is Km divided by Vmax. So if both the Km and the Vmax decrease, the slope ends up staying the same. So if you see a line weaver burke plot where the inhibitor causes a shift in the line but with the same slope, so these two lines are parallel, that's going to be a pretty clear sign of an uncompetitive inhibitor. In practice, uncompetitive inhibitors are pretty rare, but one example is that the amino acid phenylalanine will inhibit alkaline phosphatase only when it is bound to its substrate. To summarize, enzyme inhibitors are compounds that change the enzyme kinetics in a way that reduces the enzyme's ability to complete the reaction. Competitive inhibitors, whether they are reversible or irreversible, are going to bind the active site, while non- or uncompetitive inhibitors will bind to sites other than the active site. Any type of inhibitor that renders an enzyme unable to bind to any more substrate or unable to transform it into a product after the inhibitor binds is going to decrease the Vmax of the reaction. So that's going to be our irreversible competitive inhibitors, 
our non-competitive inhibitors and our uncompetitive inhibitors. Reversible competitive inhibitors don't have an effect on the VMAX, but they're going to increase the apparent KM because the substrate now has to compete with that reversible competitive inhibitor in order to bind to the enzyme active site. Irreversible competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors don't affect the KM because the binding site of the enzymes that are still available for substrate binding are unaffected. Uncompetitive inhibitors are going to decrease the KM by driving equilibrium away from free substrate and towards forming the enzyme substrate complex. I think the most important ones to be able to tell apart are the reversible competitive inhibitors and the non-competitive inhibitors. Particularly being able to recognize that reversible competitive inhibitors shift the Michaelis-Menten curve to the right, while non-competitive inhibitors shift it down is particularly high yield. On a line Weaver-Burke plot, Reversible competitive inhibitors are going to rotate the line about the y-intercept, while non-competitive inhibitors are going to rotate the line about the x-intercept.